Well, everyone, we are officially back talking Superman and Lois. It's been not even six months, right? It ended in August, so it's back in January. That's like four months it's been on hiatus, and it's back for season two. Another 13-episode order, I think, that could be extended to 15 like the last one was. I do want to say interesting because I think there's something very fun about this show that it's managed to capture a grand scale feeling while still being filmed in the middle of the COVID stuff because that's something that I think really hindered the, the third, no, the second season of Stargirl, I should say. That felt empty at times. I think Doom Patrol kind of did the same thing where there are certain moments where you just felt the hollowness where it's like we couldn't have everybody in the room to do this scene. When it comes to this first episode of the second season, it does a good job of doing that because I think the show was already based in the COVID era where we are having certain characters in a room together, like two characters, three characters. So there's never been like the overwhelming feel where everybody has to be in a scene. So it's fine. And I think this did a great job of just capturing that feeling again. And this episode in particular really established that we're taking some big swings here. I, I've said this before, and I will e reiterate it here again. I think the Hotchlin and Tullock chemistry is on par or rivals that of Reeve and Kidder. They are just perfect for the inversion of Superman and Lois they are supposed to represent. It's modern, it's updated, it's a little bit different than the stuff we've seen in previous movies or in the comics, and that's good. Because when you're doing Superman on television, you got to get away from the Dean Cain stuff, from the Smallville stuff. You want to try to do something different. And making them parents is a great swing. And it's hitting on all cylinders. So we do open up this season right where we left off from the last one. Natalie has somehow survived the wreckage and she has returned to this new world to meet her father. And she instantly recognizes Lois and thinks that's her mother. This leads to a really interesting arc for Lois throughout this episode that I think is different than what people were expecting. I expected there to be some like, oh, reservations that she wants to call me mom and I instinctively want to call her daughter. But what Lois is really experiencing is that she feels like her own mother seeing a child that desperately loves her and having no attachment and abandonment towards that kid, which I think is really more interesting than what they could have done where it's just like desperately trying to cling to the daughter. It's like, I felt nothing seeing this woman who loves me. That is a really really interesting choice to make and I think it works so well for this Lois because there is sort of an attachment to the Lois Lane character where she just kind of like it exists in this world where things happen and she isn't always connected to everything so she's detached a little bit but the fact that she feels bad she felt nothing is really Lois Lane and I think that's a really cool element that they adapted in here so we see that Natalie tries to go to school in Metropolis but John is kind of worried she isn't going to fit in and she doesn't so she doesn't even go to school and that's kind of a cool feeling. So now she can adapt to the different world. They do come to Smallville at the end of the episode. And we get a nice moment where we see Natalie trying to accept herself into the Kent family. I do think that is a sweet moment. And I'm very curious to see how Natalie's relationship with the rest of the family is going to play into everything. That side story was great because you see Lois is kind of like upset of her own kids throughout the episode. They're doing things that make her mad instinctively just because she's dealing with her own frustration of not being able to love somebody else. That's really cool. <laughs> it's very Lois Lane. And it culminates into a great scene with both John and Jordan. So John brings a girl home. And we see that Lois gets mad about that. And it doesn't really work out. Again, they're trying to convince us that these kids are 15. They look... I think Jordan looks more 15 because he's just shaggy and rough looking. But John looks like an adult. And I think he's actually younger than the actor playing Jordan. It's weird, but I, I get... Okay, they're, they're 15... It's not as egregious as some of the other CW stuff where you see a 27-year-old playing a 16-year-old. They look age-appropriate, to say the least. That's fine, and it works. And then Jordan goes to hang out with Sarah. It doesn't go the way he's according, and his mom kind of snaps at him for not wanting to talk about it. Great stuff there. It's also interesting the way they're setting up the relationship stuff with John and Jordan. Now, I have to say it again. Some people said it in my comments again. I just want to say it. This is not the Jonathan Kent we are seeing in the comic books, there's huge differences and departures. He does not have the powers. He is not acting as Superman. He is still a 15-year-old. He's in between the John that we saw originally when he premiered and the John there. If there is one thing that I could potentially see crossing over from the comic books to this John, again, this is a maybe, 
it would be the bisexuality. I think that is something, especially in a show like this that's been very modern, they would look at as something they could bring in. Now, I, I could definitely see that going the route for Jordan. I could see that going around for John too, but John is currently with his girlfriend and they are having some good time there. So I do enjoy that. I do think we're going to see some tension built up in Jordan and Sarah more so. And the reason I say that is because Sarah went away to camp where she was a counselor for some reason. She comes home and she's having reservations seeing Jordan. She doesn't feel like she wants to talk to him. Obviously, the tension there is building up to there's a new romance blossoming in her life. Now... I think there's two ways that this could lead into something. It could be, or three ways actually. It could be somebody from Metropolis that maybe picked on Jordan that she met instinctively at this camp. It could be the child of maybe a supervillain from Superman's rogues, like maybe a toy man or, you know, maybe one of Lex's clones or something. And she just instinctively meets that person at the camp. Or it could be she is bisexual and then there is a woman that she met at camp i think all of those reasons enough would be something to pit her against jordan in a way the chemistry between those two actors is still there and i do like that they're setting up this interesting tension where they're still kind of figuring out their romance and jordan's trying a little too hard and it comes off as desperate and it leads to a great moment with sarah and her father where he's like the kid's insecure so he's gonna try to do you know grand gestures to please you you should just accept that and he should just realize he's batting out of his league. And again, again, I need to say this every time too because I, I reiterate this a lot. The character of Kyle is so interesting to me because he could so easily have been annoying, so easily have been played up as the terrible husband to Superman's ex-girlfriend. But he's so nice and caring and he gets jealous that his wife is being able to do all this fun stuff and meet these people and he just feels kind of bad that he can't do more for his community and he just like, I guess I'm just the guy delivering shrimp cocktails. He just wants to instinctively do more and they're actually making him a good guy. You know, last season we had the tension where everyone was kind of against the Langs because they supported Tal, Rowe, and Morgan Edge's plans. But now they're doing something with them that's really cool. Lana is winning the community back. She is working with this new guy running for mayor. I have to imagine I don't know there's going to be some connection to him and the stuff going on because that's how it always is the new guy that shows up there is always the evil there that's lying underneath but we do see that Kyle's like I want to do some more so I think Kyle I, I'm going to say this, this is my current theory working for the season I think Kyle is going to learn the truth about Clark and Superman and he's not going to tell Lana or Sarah and again they mention that they have another kid. We don't see the other kid for some reason. They mentioned Sophie's so excited to see it. They literally have an earthquake this episode, and we see that Kyle is holding Sarah and Lana. But where's Sophie? <laughs> Sophie is nowhere to be found. Again, why even write the kid into this if we're not going to do anything with the kid? Like, it, There's no point to that whatsoever. But whatever, I digress from that. And those are some great side stories for this, but there's kind of like a big theme that we're seeing here with the actual Superman stuff. So... We get a couple of things. We see Clark rescues a submarine that looks like it's crashing into the sea. He does starts having like these weird visions of something escaping through the earth, and we're going to come back to that in a bit here. But he does save this submarine, and there was a kind of a concern. I know there's some chatter online about it. I was one of the people who was thinking this. You have a great first season. The budget was obviously what you needed it to be. If the numbers weren't good, your second season budget would probably dip a little bit. So I was like, we're swinging on all cylinders here. How is the CG going to look? How are the effects going to look? They're on par of season one. Like him lifting that submarine and landing it on shore. It looked as good as the stuff we saw in the first season, if not better, because maybe it was clouded in darkness a little bit. So it just hit some of the actual bad effects. But that looked fantastic. The water sequence of Superman just diving into the water was really cool. I think this new suit looks good for Hodgson because it's it's tighter, it's sleeker, it actually form fits him a little bit more where his head doesn't look a little small with these big shoulders. It looks really good and that sequence was great, but the reservation is for this scene that the DOD is kind of upset because that submarine was North Korean and that he's like, why didn't you just bring it to American shores and we could have something done about that. So we got this new guy. Last season, we saw that Sam retired. He's no longer working with the DOD. He's just like, I'm just going to be, you know, the, the beach bum grandfather who shows up when the plot needs me. This new guy, I think it's what, Sar General Anderson or something. He is very much a man of America. And he's telling Superman, get in line or get the hell out. 
And this leads to uh, something we literally just confirmed at DC Fandom this year. Superman's moniker is changing. It's no longer Truth Justice in the American way, something it hasn't been for literally decades. The official title is Truth Justice and a Better Tomorrow. Because Superman is not solely an American character, he has never really been solely an American character. He's just steeped in American lore and mythology, but he is literally a man of the world. He has pledged his allegiance to the world long before he pledged it to America. He even says that in here. And I think that's just a great way to use this because, again, General Anderson here is trying to appropriate the symbol, the House of L, and turn it into an American symbol where it's like, you know, the shield in Captain America or whoever wields it is a patriot of America. And we see that he's created some weird Kryptonian soldiers, potentially metahumans or something like that, that are going to be wearing the House of L logo. Again, I do kind of hope they, they steer away from the completely Kryptonian bad guys. And it's just like, we have Talro, we don't need to do like another thing where it's evil Superman. But I think one of the good things it's doing here is like, this isn't solely Kryptonian. It's just more like we're using the government to do it. So they could be seen as bad guys because government evil. But they could just be soldiers doing a job. And they want to wear this symbol that inspires hope across the world and across America. So they're going to do that. So Superman's going to be at odds with the DOD. Makes sense to me because, again, he's not an American soldier. He's not an American patriot. He's a man of the world. He's the man for a better tomorrow. I think that works really well. And we do get a nice sequence at the end where he's given his sons to talk about the birds and the bees in an only way that Clark Kent could. It was just so awkwardly perfect. And I enjoyed Again, it's the right combination of awkward, silly, and heartfelt and proper. He's just <laughs> the best Clark. It is amazing how well things are working. And he gets some advice about women from Kyle earlier on, too. I'm like, that is just such a Clark Kent thing to do. Let the guy who's obviously the more macho guy just talk about how you treat women and how you respect women. That was such a great Clark Kent moment because that is just Clark. Just letting some guy tell him what to do when he instinctively knows what the right thing is. Perfect. Just a perfect way to cap this episode and a perfect way to get us back into this world. We have Natalie and John being main characters. I... I don't want to say, because I hope it's not the case, I don't want to say we're going to start up a romantic love triangle with Natalie, John, or Jordan, and Sarah, and whatever, Sadie, is that the name of John's girlfriend? I hope we don't do that. I hope it's just more like a sisterly and brotherly connection as opposed to the romantic one, but they are young. It is connected to the CW, so I won't be surprised if we get some weird pseudo-sexual tension building up in there. We are needing to get a new reporter hired at the Smallville Gazette, so we'll see who could that be. Maybe we'll bring in... Lucy is rumored to appear in this season, but played by Janet DeWin, so maybe she'll stay for a little bit longer and actually work at the Gazette. I'd like that, actually, because Janet DeWin should do more, and I think she's a great fit for this version of Lois. So we'll have to see if that works out, but I loved all of it. Everything with this season was great. Again, Lois continues to be a standout to me, and they're giving her some mature things to deal with that aren't just, you know, I'm this silly reporter who's kind of got a hard edge. It's like, no, I felt the love that this woman shared for her mother, and I cannot reciprocate that. And her moment on the bench with Natalie is fantastic. If not, only outshined by the end cliffhanger where we see something breaking through the earth. What is it? Well... If you are a comic book fan, you might be able to read the sound bites of the crack, 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 and then boom, and then doom, and you're like, okay, you're doing this that early? So it hasn't really been confirmed last I checked, but the big theory that everyone's seeing online, when that hand crushes out through the dirt, is that Doomsday is making his way through the Earth's core to come fight Superman, and I think, okay, I have a lot of feelings on this, we'll probably get more into it when the time comes to talk about it, but that is a lot to deal with because Doomsday is a character that I don't think you should use again. <laughs> Just every time we do it, it's weird and it doesn't work perfectly, but I get the need to try. I really do. So I hope that works out for something good, but Doomsday and Superman and Lois season two. Okay. I'd like to see, you know, other characters introduced. I could definitely see this going the route of the cyborg Superman. I could definitely see something with the Eradicator coming back up, and I could see a pseudo-Superboy thing. One of the writers did put a secret origin post on Twitter, which leads me to believe, and I could be way off base here, that Legion of Superheroes, <laughs> I could see Saturn Girl appearing. 
I could see a short story where John or no, where Jordan or John, maybe both of them go to the future and they become legionnaires and maybe John gets a legion ring and he becomes lightning lad or something. <laughs> I don't know. We could see it. That's all I'm saying is that's a possibility of something we could see. But this season, it came back strong. The effects were great. The acting was great. The story was fantastic and everything hit perfectly. And it's going to be a show for a better tomorrow, which I cannot wait to see. So I'll be back every week to talk Superman and Lois, just like the first season. If we get a third season, I'll be back to talk about that. But once again, thank you guys for watching this review. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And I'll catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck.